Now that we've completed our uh, introductions, we can move on to our um, topic today, and that is how diversification works. That'll be presented by Greg Dietrich. And to introduce Greg, Greg's been an investor for nearly 20 years and unemployed for five of those years. <laughs> More importantly, he learned along the way that nurturing a portfolio of different investments combined with paying off debt and a bit of luck could lead to financial independence. When he's not cooking up ideas for meetings, you'll find him walking on the bike trail close to his home or planning his next vacation adventure. And with that, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Alan Baker. He's uh, recently volunteered to help us with the Zoom co-hosting and today with the uh, Q&A. And, uh, you know, it's important for all of us to take part and do our part. And uh, that really makes it possible for occasionally one of us to take a month off and not do too much. And so I just wanna say, Alan, I appreciate it very much. And we'll hear more from him uh, a little bit after the presentation. Uh, so thank you, Alan. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the view here because I, I kind of control the view, at least for the recording I do. You can go back and forth between gallery and speaker view. And uh, we're gonna be in and out for, for a second or two. We're gonna be, um, let's see if I can, modify this a little bit. I think this is right. I'm going to try to share my screen and we'll be sharing and unsharing a couple of times. Uh, let's see here. There we are. Uh, would someone unmute and let me know if you see a nice forest? Yes, I see it. Thank yep. you. Yes. Thank you very much. Now, if I got these queued up, if I pick the right ones, we'll be in business. Okay, there we are. So uh, let's see here. I'm gonna shrink this a little bit. See if I can. Okay, um, I'm looking at Chris Goslow right now. Is, is, is What's everybody else seeing on this recording? Uh, we see your presentation. And that's it? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. I think, I guess whoever's talking will be on here. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be seeing, uh, seeing or not. So I'm going to try to shrink this. I'm a little amateurish at, at Zoom. I hope you don't mind. Uh, anyway, thank you everyone for uh, coming today. Our uh, presentation such as it is, is called How Diversification Works. And uh, I'm going to try to shift screens. Here we are. So our agenda today, um, what is risk? We're gonna talk about what investment risk is. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about diversification, including some reasons why you should diversify. Uh, we'll get into uh, uh, why diversification works uh, by listening to probably the second most well-known living Princeton economist, who will have something interesting to say about that, If I, assuming that I can get a YouTube video to work. Uh, and then we'll go be stepping through an article called the six stages of diversification, and then we'll do Q&A after that. And uh, what you see below you is a, uh, a very familiar quote from Harry Markowitz from the 60s, diversification is the only free lunch. So what is risk? I think first we should note that we generally assess risk uh, poorly or not well. Uh, and here's my example. Uh, a National Transportation Safety Board study found that in an air crash or emergency landing, 95% of passengers survive. 55% of those involved in a very serious crash are expected to survive. Um, so wh what's another factoid? Well, only one in 11 million flights result in a crash. Uh, so the question is this, what are your chances of dying upon a airplane that you know is gonna crash, that does crash. And here are your choices, 5%, 45%, 100%, 100%, very small number, a decimal followed by seven zeros and nine zero, nine zero, nine zero ad infinitum. If you're a math whiz, you'll know exactly what's happening here. Uh, and uh, the next choice is about half of that number, even smaller, and zero. So I'm gonna leave this up for a second and let you come up with your own uh, thoughts on what you think the percentage of, uh, what your chances are of dying in, a, in an airplane accident, okay? So there's the same question restated at the top of this slide. 
And of course, the correct answer depends on a few things. And this is a few things I thought about. If you board the plane as part of the cleaning crew and you remember to get off, uh, your chance of dying is zero. Uh, okay, or close to zero, unless you fall off the, uh, the stand uh, next to the tarmac. Uh, if you board the airplane, however, with a captain or first officer who is bound and determined to take the plane down because he doesn't like his life, uh, I'm afraid your chances are very slim that you will, uh, that you will survive. Uh, the chance of dying would be 100%. Um, but for all other cases that I thought of, 5 and 45% are both reasonable answers. So th this sounds a little macabre, so I hopefully I'll pull, pull this out of here. What if we change the question? So instead of a, a surefire way of dying in an airplane crash that you know is going to happen, what, if your what are your chances of dying uh, after boarding an airplane, say a regularly scheduled passenger plane, any airplane? Well, at this point, the answer is different. The answer changes because then the small numbers found in D and E are much closer to what will, uh, to reality. They're very, very small. Um, each of us, when we board an airplane, are not going to be, uh, shouldn't be worried too much about dying. But you should note, and I'm reading off uh, from below the three notes that I have at the bottom of the screen, uh, no matter how you feel about it, no matter how nervous you may be, uh, that is entirely unrelated. Uh, to whether you will die in an airplane incident. And uh, you should also keep in mind, and this will maybe help uh, nervous flyers if we have any on this call, that the most frequent flyers, the people that fly all the time, including airline pilots, have very nearly the same odds of surviving. That is, high odds of surviving, a very low, low chance of, of dying. There's only one sure thing. If you do die in an airplane crash, the odds of dying in another one are zero. So I think I skipped one here. Okay, so let's talk about investment risk. We're gonna widen it out a bit. Kevin, can you see the uh, blue screen? Yes. Not really. Not really? Uh, is the top or bottom missing? No. Too small. I have everything on the screen. Yeah, Too I small. I can see it. <laughs> okay. You know what? Uh, instead of instead of being in gallery view, way you might consider going into speaker view, and I think it will increase. For for those of you who are, I'm just a one tiny square in the middle of the screen, uh, try changing your own view in Zoom to speaker view. Did that help? Well, I don't uh, hear anyone, but. On a computer screen, uh, with it filling up the screen that is just seeing your desktop, uh, it is legible and okay. we see the whole thing. Okay, I, I'm going to read through some of this. So, for those of you who are unable to change views in the speaker view or are unable otherwise to read it, I'll I'll step through what's important here. Uh, this is an intimidating list, and I wish I could tell you that we have encapsulated all of the various investment risks, but I'm afraid. Uh, these are just some of the more well-known ones, but we're going to step through a few of them. Uh, the first one is unsystematic and systematic risk, and they're called diversifiable or market risk. Uh, unsystematic is the measure of risk associated with one particular security or a security, I should say. And uh, how do you uh, combat that risk? Basically by holding a diversified portfolio of many stocks across sectors or across industries. Uh, then there's market risk. Uh, market risk is the risk of your, uh, that, uh, the, if your portfolio value is going up and down uh, rather violently. They call that market volatility. And that particular risk cannot be diversified away in the same way. Uh, and, and it says here that the type of risk most people are referring to when they use the risk uh, when discussing investments. I'm not sure that's a, a truism, but uh, we'll just accept that at the moment. So of course, we want to be able to affect things, something we can do something about. There's no reason to wring our hands about things that we have no control over. Some other risks include liquidity risk. Uh, liquidity risk is when you have an asset and nobody wants to buy it. Uh, so if you cannot sell it, you cannot find a buyer or there's very few buyers out there, uh, then that's called liquidity risk. And here the example they use is treasury securities. Um, 
Well, they just say they have the least liquidity risk. I think that's uh, correct as far as bonds because uh, they call them a zero risk asset. Uh, technically, that's not true. There is a slight amount of risk involved, but it's, it's so trivial that they, it gets that nomenclature. People just say that's the risk-free rate. Uh, there's political risk, which is far more serious. Uh, and I don't mean just Democrat or Republican here. Of course, this is uh, due to changes in the law or even a political regime. Uh, so there's great uh, potential for uh, serious risk to your uh, portfolio if we're talking about a collapse of a government. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere near that and most many governments now are pretty stable. But if you're uh, example, uh, for example, invested in foreign stocks, you have to make that consideration, particularly if you narrow it to a particular geographic region or country. Um, there's inflation risk. And I should also add with political, there's also just changes to tax law uh, or changes in SEC regulations or some other way, uh, changes to taxation, which happens pretty much all the time. There's inflation risk, which is a little more pernicious. Um, I think we agreed in our last meeting that we're not faced with rampant inflation right now. This is not one of our uh, current concerns, uh, but there is inflation every year or there is inflation in most years. Um, and all of the assets that you have are subject to that inflation, uh, which is one reason why we invest is to beat that inflation. And how do you mitigate that risk? Um, this is an article, by the way, from uh, Boglehead's Wiki. And it says, well, it can be mitigated by investing in inflation protected treasury bonds, such as TIPS or I bonds. Um, I, um, I won't argue with that, but I'll say that this was written about 10 years ago and it, it, hasn't, it didn't help as much as they thought it would, at least in a, in a crash, uh, which is a different type of risk. That's more of a, uh, I guess that could be a political risk, uh, but the inflation can nibble away at your assets over time. So we wanna uh, be aware of that so we can guard against it. Uh, and I think there are other ways to fight inflation risk, such as owning uh, stocks, which are much more resilient. Financial risk is the next one. Um, that has to do with the structure of a particular company. Uh, corporate debt says magnifies financial risk to a company's stocks and bonds. Uh, so you're aware of companies that go out of business. What's the answer for that? Well, you try to own multiple companies. Uh, management risk. Um, here it talks about actively managed funds, um, portfolio managers which under, who underperform benchmarks, uh, and that could be because they change the style of their investing, or they make some other decision. I think this could also apply to companies. Um, the, uh, I, I think of Enron as an example, but I'm gonna get into that in a couple of slides. So I'll, I'll save that, I'll pull that back. Um, and here it says that uh, investors can avoid management risk by selecting passively managed index funds. And the reason for that, of course, is because you own so many companies. Uh, that's the, the reason for that protection using an index fund. Uh, bond investors also face a number of risks and they don't list them all here uh, because bonds in general are less risky, but you have to be, you have to know a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, there's interest rate risk, uh, which can affect asset price. Uh, the bond, both bonds, individual bonds and bond funds uh, can, are, do respond to assets, uh, I'm sorry, to interest rate changes. Um, so, you have to watch out for that. Uh, um, if there is a, a great uh, jump in interest rates, the yield goes down and vice versa. Um, interest rate risk is greater for bonds with longer maturities because of that lever action, the leverage, uh, and it's lower for bonds that have short maturities. Um, so I'm, I'm not a bond expert and I don't think I'm gonna get into this, but you should just be aware this is a risk. Uh, and there's credit risk. Uh, the risk of default when uh, uh, companies cannot pay their debts, they're in serious trouble. Uh, usually it's the stockholders who first get hit, but if the bondholders get hit, uh, that, that affects the value of, of those bonds. Uh, obviously, if you don't get paid, there was a, a whole bunch of municipal uh, bankruptcies, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, and some of those bondholders came away with very little or nothing. Other risks that um, apply to uh, basically to bond investments, call risk, reinvestment risk. Um, basically, this, this can apply to uh, bond funds, 
So when the fund manager goes out to purchase more bonds to replace their existing bonds, uh, the yields could have changed and you're not gonna get the same return for that fund. It, some, sometimes there's a delay um, of a few years even. Uh, and there's currency risk, which really applies to the world currencies and how they uh, compare against the dollar. Um, and it does mention here that this is not just a bond risk, this is a risk to international stocks as well for uh, unhedged currencies. Okay, so this gives you a sampling of the various investment risks. And I, we're gonna leave the risk here at that and, and move on to the risk return chart. And let's see here. I'm gonna to try to center this on the screen so everybody can see it. Uh, it's probably the best I can do. Uh, so here's, here's an interesting quote. Risk is the uncertainty that an investment will earn less uh, or rather the uncertainty that the investment will earn its expected return. Um, that's where the risk is involved in. And what you see before you is a probably nine-year-old chart that uh, shows a various, uh, let's see if you can see my pointer here. It shows various types of investments and the risks that they represent. And you notice one axis is the uh, percentage of returns, that the, basically a range of returns that an investment can earn. And across the bottom are the types of asset classes or rather investments. Um, so you notice that here, and I think this still applies, uh, the percentages are gonna be a little bit smaller since this is nine-year-old data. Uh, for US treasury bills, what they call a risk-free asset, uh, although not quite risk-free, it's about as close as you can get. And the average over time has been 4% more or less. Uh, that's from 1928 to 2011. And then if you move to the right, there are other asset classes. There's US Treasury bonds, which earn a little bit more, at least they have historically. But you notice associated with that, there is a higher range of possible returns. So there's a little bit, uh, a little bit more downside risk, and, uh, but quite a bit uh, potential for upside as well. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, asset classes that you can stick in between Treasury bonds there's um, corporate bonds, uh, municipals, high yield that are between these two, between US bonds and US stocks, but they're not represented on this chart. Um, and then finally we have US stocks and even riskier would be say uh, international stocks. Riskier than that might be em emerging developed markets, emerging market stocks. Um, the expected return is higher, why? Because the risk is higher. So uh, using this chart, you kind of get an idea of where your portfolio is. If some people's portfolio, they have uh, a large percentage of stocks. You may be invested in international stocks or other types of investments that are very risky. Uh, the main lesson from this whole, whole thing is that risk and return are together. So this is the conclusion. Risk and return are not dating. They're not going steady. They are married. Uh, they're inextricable. Uh, they go together. Uh, so usually with higher returns, you can only get that by taking more risk. But because of that risk, the higher expected returns may not result in anything you realize. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the whole idea. Uh, so you may be in small cap value and you may have heard this is a great factor to be in. Uh, but what if, what if uh, we go 20 years and small cap value doesn't even uh, beat the S&P. Uh, that's definitely, it's much riskier. And in this particular case, maybe it doesn't pay off. So you took the risk and you didn't win. Uh, if you have a very safe investment, say a, a bond fund of some type, it will not earn anywhere near the returns that a small cap value possibly could earn. Uh, but you're probably not going to, it probably won't be down as well. So it's a safe store of cash. So let's talk about the, uh, basic definition of what is diversification. And uh, this comes from uh, the Investopedia, so take that as, uh, uh, as I offer it. Diversification is a risk management strategy that mixes a wide variety of investments within a portfolio. So a diversified portfolio contains a mix of assets and investment vehicles, I think we're talking about the same thing, in an attempt to limit exposure to a single one of them. And the thinking behind this technique 
is that if you have a portfolio constructed of different kinds of assets, on average, you have a promise of yielding higher returns, um, than, particularly than if you own a single security or even a group of say 30 stocks, which is a kind of a common holding for stock pickers. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can center the screen a little bit. Um, and this, this presentation is, contains more words than I would like, um, but I didn't think the graphics would serve as better as some of, some of the verbiage, so I'm gonna uh, push on. Diversification is a way to try to reduce risk by choosing a blend of investments. So with a diversified portfolio, you spread your money across different types of asset classes or types of investments. And uh, this particular quote, I think this is from Stock Market Concepts. Uh, they say there's three main asset classes. I would have said two because I kind of conflate cash and fixed income, but here they separate them out. So there's cash and cash equivalents, such as savings accounts, money market funds, I would say uh, certificates of deposit, uh, then there's fixed, what they call fixed income investments, such as bonds and bond mutual funds. Uh, and then finally, there's equities, clearly a different asset class. Uh, and that contains, say, stocks. It could be stock funds or ETFs. And I uh, happen to like this uh, little verbiage down here where it says four reasons to diversify. Uh, I see two reasons there. I think the first three can be kind of blended together, but since they restate the same thing different ways, uh, I think they're kind of interesting. We'll go through them. There are four reasons why you should diversify. Uh, and one reason is not all types of investments perform well at the same time. Obviously some go up when certain periods and others go down. And then this sort of elaborates, I think, extends the, the, the thinking behind number one. Number two says different types of investment react differently to world events, interest rates, and other economic factors. Uh, and when I, when I read number two, I think, okay, investments react differently to world events. Probably most of you, in fact, I'm sure all of you remember a year ago, a year ago when the world uh, first learned of the COVID-19 and um, originally thought to be a, a, a kind of a remote for if you didn't live in Wuhan, China, uh, then this was sort of uh, far away. Well, who warned uh, within a month or so that this was gonna become a worldwide problem and later CDC uh, confirmed that. And sure enough, it was in Europe and the United States and all over the world and you know the, the history. Uh, well, what did the stock market do? Well, at the time the stock market uh, took a huge decline, uh, but there were a few stocks that did well. Now the stocks that did not do well a year ago were things like what? Any place that um, like that had to do with vacations, um, traveling the world. So airline stocks went down, uh, cruise lines went down, uh, vacation rental properties and so forth and so on. Anything that was tied to stock, uh, they did not do well. What kinds of stocks did quite well a year ago? What led us out of that? What created that V-shaped recovery? Well, it was anything, any company that, that serviced our needs as a shelter in place. So grocery delivery services, uh, Zoom, and many other types of communication software, Zoom Zoomed. And now let's go a year later. We had a great recovery. Stock market is way up, still remains high. It's, I think it's at uh, records uh, this week. What kind of stocks are doing well? What kind of stocks are not now that we finally turned the corner? Uh, after having several million deaths around the world from COVID. Well, the stocks that are doing well are the same stocks that did terribly last year. And the stocks that are not doing so well uh, now, we're doing wonderfully. Zoom is no longer Zooming, unfortunately. It's, it's gone down quite a bit. Um, many of the delivery services that were so prevalent and that were leading the stock market into August, seeing those record highs, seeing the total recovery, uh, some of them are faltering as well in recent weeks. Uh, this is to be expected. Different types of investments react differently to world events. Um, interest rates, of course, is another factor. Uh, so number three, when type one type of investment is down, this is just a restatement, another may be up, okay? Maybe they're belaboring the obvious, but this is important to remember. So four, good reason here, have a mix of different investments may reduce your volatility. That is, help smooth out your returns. 
you'll have fewer up 30% years, but you'll have fewer down 40% years. Uh, just as a simple illustration, if you have stocks and if you have, if you're someone who believes in 100% stocks, you can have a great year. You can have several great years, but you could also have a serious down year where you lose a lot of that value. If you have some bonds in that portfolio, say 10 or 15%, you temper that, um, you temper the crashes. You won't earn quite as much, at least we don't think, we don't think it'll earn quite as much based on uh, historical, uh, particularly in the long run, but it will make, it, make your portfolio in general less volatile. So this is gonna be an experiment for us, uh, for me in, in particular, it'll be challenging. Uh, I would like you to listen to a two minute video uh, from a Princeton economist who uh, was, became very well known in the early seventies, uh, Burton Malkiel. He wrote a, a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which sort of punctured the idea that um, uh, Wall Street and sock pickers were good at what they did uh, or mutual fund managers for that matter. Uh, so this guy became rather famous. He became a friend of Jack Vogel. He learned, later served on the board at Vanguard. Um, he now is associated with a different company. Uh, but I would like you to hear what he has to say about this. And I've got it queued up, but I'm going to do. I'm going to stop share here for a second. And I'm going to try to queue this up. And if for some reason any of you who are unmuted, if you cannot hear the screen, please let me know. Hasn't started yet, but I will start it in a second. Okay, here we go. I can't hear it. I can't see it. Okay. Uh, who said that? Chris. <clears throat> you cannot see the, the screen? That's correct. I'm not getting anything either. We just I see think you. it's across the board. Nothing. Uh oh. Okay. What, what do you see? You. We see you, the you viewer. Uh, viewer. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try this again. I, I probably made a mistake. I probably made a mistake, and so I'm going to. Are you sharing the right window? <laughs> yeah, give me a second here. I practiced this last night, and, and it took me several tries to get it even halfway right. So I'm going to try this again, OK? Just give me a, a, a second here, and we'll make sure I'm sharing this. Um. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. Now we see your computer screen. Uh, okay, that's probably better. Okay, let me know still uh, after it starts if you cannot hear it. I'm gonna extend this again. Diversification uh, did get hear it. a Go bad ahead. name. Yeah, I got it during uh, the first decade of the 2000s. And it got a bad name because what it seemed was that everything was highly correlated together. What the idea of diversification is, you want some asset classes where when one asset class zigs, the other zags, and you have a more stable uh, portfolio. And the reason it got a bad name is when you looked at the third quarter of uh, 2008, and I use that because that was the uh, kind of quarter where there were days when the Dow Jones averages fell 50 points, I mean 500 points, excuse me, uh, in one day. This was the time when everyone was just terribly nervous. And it got a bad name because everything was going down then. There was no place to hide. The way uh, I remember people talking at that time was, Diversification fails you just when you need it most. Well, diversification didn't fail you in the first decade of the 2000s because the U.S. market did zero in the first decade of the 2000s. You made no money in the U.S. market. 
You made no money in the European market uh, in the first decade of the 2000s. You ne made no money in Japan. But if you had a weighting of emerging market stocks, the fast-growing emerging markets, the Chinas, the Indias, the Brazils, and so forth, even though the ups and downs tended to be correlated, you made about 10% a year. So it isn't the case that even when everything is correlated, that the performance of markets is going to be the same. And one of the things that our advisory committee uh, has done is to make sure we are broadly diversified and that we're going to have some asset classes in there, even though the ups and downs are going to look similar, we've got some asset classes that are very likely to do well when others do poorly. Okay. I uh, hope, hope everybody enjoyed that and you got to see it. So I'm going to try to reshare my screen again. Uh, I found I had to do this last night so that uh, everyone can see the uh, whiteboard again. Okay. Yeah, we see your computer screen, Greg. Very good. Okay, so the, uh, I got it to work. It only took me a minute. <laughs> so thank you everyone for your patience there. Uh, so it's really interesting what uh, Burton Mal Malkiel reports that uh, true enough, uh, people thought diversification uh, didn't work. A lot of people were saying that. I remember them saying that from about 2005, 2006, uh, that um, stocks weren't doing very well. We were uh, in uh, a pretty severe recession. This is about the time I started to uh, invest. Um, and the markets were, had, had been on a skid, had been on a slide for several years. And uh, after all the excitement with the technology uh, stocks in the late 90s uh, and early 2000, uh, it was quite a disappointment. People were actually abandoning stocks, not just tech stocks. Um, but what saved that particular decade, if you had, uh, I don't have a calendar chart handy, but you saw, we uh, showed one last month. Uh, there are several years where their emerging markets were absolutely the top performer. And uh, that's what saved your bacon. If you had some international stocks, you did pretty well. And if you were emerging markets, you did really well during that period. Okay, so at this point, we're, we're on the home stretch. And what I'd like to do here is to step through an excellent article, uh, just an excerpt from an article written by Jim Dale, uh, the white coat investor. And I like this on several levels. And then we'll look at one of his own portfolios and hoping that this will, instead of just telling, this will show what um, we mean by diversifying your portfolio. So uh, this, this article is called The Six Stages of Diversification, Where Are You At? And he splits this into six levels. Uh, and I have to say that uh, I think the first three levels are uh, very important. The other levels, maybe not, not as much for many of us. Uh, so you can think of this as uh, top down. The first level would be the most important from there on descending order of importance. And of course, the most important thing about diversification in our, with our portfolios is the stock to bond or stock to fixed income ratio. Uh, that's been uh, long known. And there have been periods in history where uh, bonds actually did better than stock. Uh, uh, some, some periods in the 2000s, um, say around 2007, 8, 9, uh, and even prior to that, uh, there was a 30-year bond uh, was actually a higher earner than the uh, than a stock fund if you'd had a total stock market fund or U.S. stocks. Uh, so bonds did better, and there have been other periods in more distant history where, uh, for 20 or 25 years, uh, you did better holding bonds. And th this is my argument to people who like to hold 100% stocks: is you ought to have some bond portion because you really don't know for sure where when we're going to enter another period when bonds might outperform. I don't think we're there at the moment uh, for various reasons because of the interest rates and because of the, uh, uh, the, whole, the whole debenture uh, um, status within the United States and around the world. I don't, I don't think bonds are going to be doing very well very soon. However, you don't know if we're at the beginning of something. Uh, it could be that 10 years from now, bonds will be the place to be. But I'm not trying to sell bonds or stocks. I'm just basically explaining that 
it's good to have that diversification within your portfolio since we're trying to protect ourselves against the risks that we outlined earlier. And he mentions that other major asset classes are real estate, precious metals, commodities, et cetera. Um, whether or not you should have those in your portfolio will leave for question time. Uh, we, can do, we can discuss that. Uh, but this is the stock bond ratio, the split between the amount of equities or company ownership and the amount of fixed income or debt that you have. Um, this is the main uh, protection. This is the main reason to diversify. Secondly, the multiple securities own a lot of everything. This, this seems to be a, a truism. If you, the more you own, uh, you're spreading out that risk. Uh, if Enron goes out of business uh, or Argentina defaults on its bonds, uh, you don't want to be the one left holding the bag on that. And I, uh, you probably remember Enron. And for those of you who don't, Enron was an energy trading company out of Texas. It was well-respected along with the tech sector. It was on fire in the late 90s. Uh, but something the stockholders didn't really know about Enron and Enron, uh, the people leading that company were uh, tramps and thieves, at least thieves. Uh, they were feathering their own nest and stealing from the company itself. And they had an auditor, auditor who was also cooking the books. So several people ended up going to prison when this was un unveiled. Uh, uh, there was at least one suicide. Uh, it was a pretty, it was a pretty serious scandal, and Enron went out of business. Now, if you're an employee of Enron, a very large employer in the Texas region, uh, or if you were a stockholder, uh, otherwise you had a focused or concentrated position, uh, you lost everything. Uh, they had nothing left to give out. I don't, I don't know how they did on on their bonds, but they may not have had any bonds at that point. So the the idea is own a lot of different things. If one of them goes up in flames. Uh, you won't be too hurt. Number three level is have multiple types of securities, have sub-asset classes. Um, here it mentions stocks, uh, US stocks, have, have some foreign stocks, developed market stocks, emerging market stocks. So developed, you think of um, uh, Europe, Japan, um, and in recent years, Taiwan and South Korea. Um, and maybe someday China will also uh, be considered a developed market stock. I think mostly it's uh, considered emerging at this point. Emerging market stocks are basically developing countries. Um, so at some point, uh, China will for sure be the uh, biggest player in this. Uh, but at the moment, uh, I believe they're still considered emerging markets. But the point is to own lots of different types. Uh, and then what about the sectors? Uh, own different types of industries, financials, utilities, staples, food, uh, energy stocks, uh, but not all Enron. Um, and then they talk about uh, different types of bonds, own different types of uh, bonds. Yes, own treasury bonds, own tips if you're concerned with um, unexpected inflation, but also own, consider owning corporate bonds, perhaps municipal bonds, depending on your tax situation. Right now, that's not really of tremendous concern, but it may be at some point. Uh, own real estate. If not actual real estate, then own it in some guise. Uh, such as in within a total stock market or own a real estate fund, single family, multifamily, retail, industrial. I, I'm not sure where public stories fits into that. I've noticed that in the Vanguard REIT fund, one of its largest uh, holdings is public storage, which is the, you know, the, the, uh, the little sheds that people between marriages and uh, household moves, that's where they put their furniture. And that business has been doing very, very well for a long time, for more than 10 years. So that's... Um, if you own a REIT fund or you own a, a total stock market or a mid cap fund, uh, you're getting some of that return. Um, then what about the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum? Are there any other that are precious? I'm not sure. Um, and commodities, pork bellies, corn, oil, orange juice, et cetera. Uh, and then possibly currencies, yen, dollars, euros, uh, pounds, rin, renminbi, I think that's the Chinese, Chinese one. And then Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. Um, I'm not saying I, I, I'm not uh, promoting any of these individually, but I'm, this is just sort of the world of different types of securities. Um, what the author is suggesting is that you ought to own a lot or a little bit of everything and not just one type of thing. 
Uh, level four is multiple factors. Now I'm, I'm kind of uh, in a weird position for my own portfolio. I consider myself a total market uh, individual. I'm a believer in the total market approach. And yet, if you look at my portfolio, you'll say, no, Greg, you're a slicer and dicer, but mostly that's just a artifact of history. I've just collected funds over the years and some of them <clears throat> it would not be advantageous to sell them. So I've left them in. Uh, but we're not here to talk about my portfolio today. In fact, hopefully we're here to talk about your portfolio a little bit. So we're just going to go over this anyway. Um, yes, uh, you can be a slicer and dicer and believe in factors. Um, some of these are academically well supported. Others are a little more dubious. Uh, which factors are, are real? Uh, most of this is research done in the last 30 or 40 years. So this that hasn't really shaken out of whether small or small value, there's any particular advantage to uh, leaning your portfolio that way. Um, value has been under attack for the last few years. That doesn't mean, could mean they're wrong. We may not have enough data. Uh, there's momentum and profitability and probably hundreds of other factors. Um, and the author notes here that they have often discovered these factors, the academics, University of Chicago and others, uh, in retrospect by putting assembling data from many decades and then they've kind of determined, oh, well, we have, if you invest more in this other one sector than another sector or value over growth, then it earns a little bit more. But remember, we're only talking about maybe a hundred years of reliable uh, capital markets data. We have uh, market data that goes back hundreds of years and it's being developed all the time, but that's a little more sketchy. They're taking out of, uh, taking that information out of uh, newspapers and that, that may or may not have gotten the facts uh, right. Um, so be aware of that. So most of you, I would imagine, are not um, slicers and dicers. Some of you definitely are. Uh, what about the total market adherence? Uh, that's a more of a typical bogohead, I think, although bogoheads can encompass uh, both. Uh, you believe, as I do, that the most diversification you can get is to own all the securities in an asset class and do it in a market cap fund. Apple is bigger than Caterpillar, so you put more of your money in Apple. So that's the, the basis for that. Now we get a little more esoteric. Um, you may have some active uh, funds in your portfolio, as I do, uh, but if you have significant active funds, in other words, you have um, a, a number of, hold on a second. Uh, if you have a number of funds, that are under active management, you might wanna consider having either several of those funds or employing several managers to uh, do the work uh, because one of your managers might be, you know, incompetent or even a thief. Um, so the author mentions hard money loans, other alternative investments. He, he advises using more than one manager to manage these. Now that's, that's not my forte, I'm not interested in hard money loans, but some of you I know are invested in that and may have other alternative investments. Um, so this one may have a little bit less um, pertinency to some of us here. And then a lot of people bring this up uh, probably more often than it's needed, but people are concerned about whether they should have all their money in one company. And the author, author suggests that level six for him is having multiple companies, in other words, um, you're afraid uh, Schwab is, may not uh, do a good job with handling your money, so you divide your assets between, say, Fidelity and Schwab or Vanguard and Schwab, what have you. Um, and the author believes that, yeah, it's okay to use a single brokerage, uh, but you could divide your investments between several. Um, now, when, when would that be appropriate? Uh, I think we talked a little bit about this last month. And, uh, or maybe it was a couple of months ago, I remember Alan Baker said, you know, you've got to think, if you don't think your money is safe at one institution, what's giving you this confidence that it's going to be safer at this other institution, A over B or B over A? And I think that was an excellent point. Um, and you also, the, if you want to go one level deeper, you might consider where the money is being held, the repositories. Vanguard actually doesn't have all of your money in its basement, although it's uh, comforting to think so. They actually have other companies that are involved in holding these funds. So if, for example, if Vanguard and Fidelity have a total stock market fund, both of them, and you decided to divide your money up between them, maybe they're both using the same repository company to hold that money. 
So if that, for whatever reason, that company went bankrupt and they couldn't insure it, uh, where would your losses be? Well, these are, this is not very likely. Uh, we're, we're, this is very far-fetched risk, risk, in my opinion, especially in the United States. Uh, but you would have to consider that as well. Uh, but his point is well taken when he discusses CDs, uh, certificates of deposit, because the advantages, if you uh, have substantial assets in using certificates, um, deposit accounts of some type, uh, you could uh, run up against the FDIC limit. Although you can open, I think, multiple accounts at a single institution. But if you choose not to do that or wish to spread it around, uh, that's one way you could diversify. Uh, so what does he think about over diversification? Well, he just has one sentence and I think this is a, a really well put. So I'm just gonna read it. The more managers, companies, factors, and investments that you own, the more hassle you're gonna have in dealing with your life. Uh, so that's something, this is kind of a cautionary thing. You can get very deep into factors and trying to develop all these different asset classes. And uh, I'm gonna show you a portfolio in a minute where um, uh, Jim Dale is used for, at least he was using it a couple of years ago. It may look a little complex for some of you, but you don't necessarily have to go there. Okay, uh, this is what I call, what I, what, this is my term for it, a 60-20-20 portfolio. Um, this is a uh, portfolio, uh, presumably uh, Jim Dale's personal portfolio that he posted online a couple of years ago uh, upon request, uh, I think one of his readers requested it. This is 60, 20, 20. By that, I mean, it's about 60% stock or equities. It's about 20% fixed income or bonds and about 20% something else. And the something else in this case is real estate in, in a couple of different guises. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you're starting off at the top, he has uh, about a quarter of his entire portfolio in a very uh, well-known and reliable uh, stock market fund, the Vanguard Total Stock Market. That's the famous BTSAX. Uh, he has a slice of it in small cap value. So you know where he's kind of a slicer and dicer. He, he's using that factor there and hoping that the portfolio will earn a little bit more money than if he was an all stock. Uh, next is he has a piece of international. 15% and another piece, 5%, so together 20%, um, FTSE EX, uh, that's XUS small index fund. So he's leaning small even in his foreign holdings. So what do we have so far? We have uh, 30, 40% um, US stocks and 20% uh, international stocks, XUS. And then, then we get into the bond portion, which is 10%. Uh, tips or inflation protected securities and a TSPG fund, which is not available to everybody. I think you have to be a federal employee or military. Uh, there may be other exceptions, uh, basically a general bond fund. Uh, so uh, temp both of those funds are bonds. So we're only talking about 20%. So that's the 20. And the last 20 is divided up in the last three entries here. He has uh, the Vanguard REIT index fund. That's one I own, 5% there. 5% in debt, what he calls debt real estate, which uh, he specifies as private hard money lending funds. So he deals in hard money loans. Uh, then the final 10% in equity real estate, private equity. Uh, and I know very little about the private equity or syndication, so I'm not gonna discuss it here. Perhaps some of you have knowledge of this. Um, I would say at a glance, if I was a financial advisor and I'm not, uh, I would say anybody who's not earning it, well, at least 500,000, maybe a million a year, uh, probably shouldn't consider this portfolio for themselves. I think that for a high income investor, uh, this uh, portfolio could make a lot of sense. And there's different ways to construct it. So I hope none of you are taking notes on what the percentages are because they'll be different for each of us. Uh, and I think it's uh, probably dubious to have too many alternatives in your portfolio unless you uh, have money to burn and um, ha have adjusted expectations or have high return expectations and can take a chance that these, those return expectations will not be met. So uh, I won't take a poll. I won't ask for a show of hands since I can't see any of you at the moment, but I wonder how many of you, your head is swimming a little bit when you see all this. Well, you, when I read down all those risks, 
I want to discuss the diversification. Uh, I hope I made it clear, but I'm, uh, I don't, uh, don't begrudge anyone who is wondering, wow, this is awfully complicated. How can I do a portfolio uh, with what you're suggesting? Too many things to think about. Well, here's something that I used um, when I was trying to decide whether I wanted to retire five years ago or now almost six years ago. Um, I took a napkin out. And since I had a budget already, I knew what I could afford. I knew roughly what a reduced pension would look like for me. And I had to make a decision um, whether I was going to retire four years early, uh, three and a half, four years earlier than I had planned. And I wanted to see if I could do it. So I took out a napkin and I wrote the basics on the napkin at lunchtime. And I, um, in the afternoon, as I recall, I had a big, long meeting that I didn't want to attend. So I told my boss, I'm not going to that meeting. He didn't seem to mind. And the next morning I came in and gave my notice said, I'm out of here. Um, you can actually, you know, if you have enough information, you have enough education, I think it's okay to, to make major decisions on a napkin. And here's one that someone did with the diversification. Uh, so think of it simply. If simple works for you, if you can understand this better, do it simply. Talk about ways to minimize risk, cash, stocks, bonds, alternatives. Um, how do you do it? Well, asset classes, geography, industry, company size. Uh, in other words, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Admittedly, a simplification. But if this works for you, then that's just fine. And finally, I'm going to um, see if I can get out of this and stop the share and hand this to Alan, who will uh, take over the Q&A function. And I'll, I'll be happy to take your questions.